New York and on the new Hot 97 app, Ebro in the Morning. On Hot 97. Ebro in the Morning, Laura Styles, Rosenberg, give it up for Jarrell Jerome. Yeah. When they see us. Yo, you from the Bronx? Yes, sir. So, um, when you got prepared for when they see us, yeah. uh, did you know the story? Um, I knew it to an extent. I knew it growing up in a way where my mom um, would mention it here and there, almost like a story among other stories, like a lesson, you know? Uh, don't be out too late, don't run with the wrong group, um, be polite to officers, and, and don't reach for your wallet, certain things like that. But in terms of the actual plight that these men went through, I, I had no idea about until Ava uh, brought it up. Um, to me, she actually posted it on Instagram. She had this screenshot of the article back from 1989. So I, I researched it right away, and I just saw that these cats were from Harlem and, and, and from the Bronx area. And so the second I saw that, I read into it, saw the documentary, and that's when I started to get involved uh, right before I auditioned for it. So did you specifically audition for the role of Corey? Yeah, I actually auditioned for young Corey. So it wasn't, it wasn't both um, in mind for me. I just... Um, went out for the younger part. But it's funny because I had this beard on my face. So with this beard on my face, I'm like 26 to people. And if I shave, I'm like 14. <laughs> <laughs> what are you actually? How old are you actually? I'm 21, so I'm kind of yeah. dead in the middle. Right? I have that you know? same problem. When I shave, I'm like 12. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But right now, you're a grown man. Everybody you loves you. Yeah. Don't listen to <laughs> me. You won't get that much younger. Um, now, but you are the only character who played both, correct? Yes, yeah. Played young and old. So... Um, the the late episodes really focus on Corey's character. Right. Like it becomes a story sort of about Corey. And I, I found the second to last episode was just brutal to to watch. Mm. The, you know, the 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 your portrayal is so painful of someone who just goes through it over and over and over again. How did you prepare for that? Like, you know, how dark a place did you kind of have to go to to to, yeah. to go there? Um, extremely dark. It was definitely uh, it was definitely the hardest experience I had to go through, mentally, uh, emotionally, just uh, tapping into that sort of mind frame for a long time. We were also shooting in real prisons, uh, you know, real real cells, and so it felt real. We had there were prisoners right upstairs. Like we, in order to go to set, we had to take off our belt, our shoes. We had to, you know, give an ID. It was it was all of that. So it kind of puts you in that mindset when you keep going back to these jails um, day after day. And then I knew Corey personally. I got to know him through the whole process. And he became a big brother to me and an inspiration to me. So it became very personal. Um, but yeah, it was it was a lot of dark places. It was a lot of taking my work home and not being able to shake it off. And as an actor, it's our job to to create these false characters, you know, to make this false world for you to for you to fall for and for you to believe that I can relate to it. But this this is not a false character, you know. Right. Specifically, many, the you know? um the solitary confinement was the yeah. hardest. Yeah. Uh, those were days alone, you know? I was doing days from 8 in the morning to 8 p.m. Then the next day we start at 4, go to 4. It was just a lot of 12, 13-hour days where I was by myself the whole time. So it really felt um, it really felt like I was in solitary. Um, but it was just three months in his shoes, you know, uh, as opposed to 14 years of what he went through and what the other men went through. But it was rough. There were, yeah. What are some of the conversations, if you could share any, that you've had with Corey personally with regard to... A, trying to understand mm. what he went through. and It's interesting because we didn't talk much about the bad parts. We didn't talk a lot about um, the, the real struggle he went through. I got to tap into those deeper moments just through the words of the script because Ava, Ava, the words of that script is what Ava got directly from those men. Mm. So I trusted that process and I trusted that the pain was there. My, my, my struggle was figuring out who he was outside of jail, you know, who he was as just a New Yorker, as just a Harlem dude. Was he the smooth type? Was he the cool type? Was he the quiet, shy guy? So that was the journey of, of getting to know him. That's what I was trying to figure out by knowing him. And just by getting to know him, this dude is so much energy, man. Like, he's, he, he'll he come up to you and be like, Queen, what's up, Queen? And, and kiss you and give you so much love. And you would not think he went through what he went through. So if he's like that now, I can't imagine what he was like before mm -hmm. the government tried to strip that from him. The guys you know? were very present. Yeah. Because um, one thing that I thought was dope, how Ava was very sharing on her social media of the yeah. production team, of, of, of everyone who was working really hard behind the scenes. Right, right. So she gave us a really dope glimpse. But I saw that the guys were there a lot as the movie was shot. Yeah. 
a lot more than I thought they would be. Just I thought it'd be a little more sensitive, but they were very proud of what we were doing, and they were very proud of the work. So they were there to support and push us through it. Those we, guys are the best, man. It's insane, Great guys. man. We've had the best pleasure guys to have them on the program. Yeah, uh, I saw that. Several, what, maybe six years ago? Mm -hmm. Maybe, something like that, um, before, before you know, a lot of this got going. But, um, you know, our station being a local New York radio station, our sister station, WBLS, was on the front lines of, keeping this story going. Uh, rest in peace to Bob Slade and, and the whole Open Line team. Yeah. Um, who was a part of being the media people that was like, something's wrong here. This is this foul. Is right. This isn't right. Um, there's a cover-up. Something's taking place. It needs to be investigated. It needs to be, I mean, they stayed with it mm. uh, for many, many years, man, to... Um, but they were overshadowed completely, right? Yeah. By yeah. the other I mean, media, by all the other... You know, there's so many powerful outlets that were talking about. No, they did do it. They, you know, calling them monsters, calling them a wolf pack and stuff. Mm -hmm. And there was no way any anybody like that could have spoken louder than CNN. Well, it's it's a it's a. Di I mean, you're from uh, the Bronx, yeah. so you know, as many uh, black and brown people that are in this city, mm -hmm. um, you would think that there would be a louder voice and a more uh, political dominance mm -hmm. and. Uh, financial influence absolutely but you know if you've grown up around here you learn that you know very few uh of the elites that run the state and the city control the money and they control the media and the black stations and the stations that speak for the community that is you know a majority of the population they're not carrying as much power as we would like you know we try you know and it just you know, it's um, it's one of those stories that I think will haunt us forever, and I hope it, and and in some way, I hope it haunts us forever, so we don't forget that this this system allowed this to happen to individuals. Well, then the irony—I don't even know if it's irony, but like the fact that now the president of the United States was was such an important person for painting these guys as being guilty in in the you know in the public eye in New York at the time. Yeah, a whole thirty years ago. Right. That's crazy. And like it might be the first real evidence of his racism that we have on record uh -huh. came then. You know what else I find fascinating about it? Because like I was really taken aback by it. And like I thought I knew the story. I'd interviewed the guys. I really thought I had an understanding of it. But your guys' portrayal of it was so heart wrenching. You know, like particularly that that like I said, your episode where he's having the fantasies about if things had just gone differently. You know, and if he if he hadn't said yes to going, like you see, he relives that over and over again. The moment where he decides, um, and then having the fantasies about being out with the girl, and like yeah. it's just it was it was so gut wrenching, and it made me realize how bugged it is. That, that was nineteen eight. That was summer eighty nine. Yeah, that's the summer that Spike Lee released Do the Right yeah, Thing. Yeah, it is. At the same moment where he's Spike's making this commentary about race in New York and America, it was happening at that exact yeah, moment. Right. I just yeah. find that, like, Well, but that just shows you how real it was in the city and that it wasn't, this is, was really happening. And once again, black folks are telling you this is the dynamic in the city. They're making songs about it. Mm. People aren't in a political or financial position to actually make the change that we know we need to see in society. Even right now, as much as people are like, you know, uh, um, the mass shootings and, uh, you know, the immigration issues and who the president actually is and what he's talking about, right? Where are all the powerful people and where is the change that everyone seems to think is the right thing and want? Yeah. It's not happening. You see what I'm saying? And that yeah. just goes to show you, A, how difficult it is to get things done, and B, how um, corrupt some of our institutions and individuals are. They don't actually give a shit. Yeah, that's what it is. It's like it becomes whose fault is it, and it's, it, at some point it's not our own fault. It's just about people not giving a shit in the end. That's why I'm big on art. That's why I'm big on um, art being medicine. Just for um, whether it's music, whether it's dancing, whether it's acting, wh when they see us, that type of show, I, I feel like that's the kind of work that gets you up finally. Mm -hmm. It sucks that it has to be on your TV while you're chilling on the couch. That really gets you up. But have you seen any of the other documentaries about Central Park Five? Yeah, I've seen them all. Yeah, the Ken so Burns one. Those came out before <coughs> this, but it took this. It took this, yeah. Right. It took it this took for this. people yeah. to well, get. What's the lady? Linda Fairstein? Yeah, yeah. Fairstein. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and the other and lady who worked Elizabeth, at Columbia yeah, out Elizabeth of their Lennon jobs. Like, there were actual 
actual factual <clears throat> documentaries with facts created. The whole time. Yeah, for years. The whole time. For years. And people ignored them. I think what it is is the show humanized these men. You know, right. like the, the Ken Burns documentary, to me, it's a Wikipedia page. You know, it's the central facts of what happened. All right. these young black Latino boys, they got punished and they did this. It was all false. You know, it was just facts. The show showed their family. It, it showed the, the heart. It showed side. their pain. Yeah, it showed dude. who they were. And then you get to see how young they are. My favorite thing about the casting of the show is that these were boys. They casted young boys, Asante Black and Ethan. They're all really young. Usually you'll see a movie where they're playing young, but it's old actors or whatever. You know. So, But you, you see the young faces in this show, and that's what humanizes them and makes them feel like, oh, this was real. It wasn't a myth. It wasn't some story that the media made you up. You also see the effects of the family. Yes, and that's to me, what one thing that brought, Like, Niecy Nash was incredible. Like, everyone yeah. was incredible. But just to see the effects on the mothers and, mm -hmm. and, and the shame that came to the family and how they were even being, um, they were basically in jail also because well. they couldn't get work. They, they couldn't no, get anything. Right, and they had no idea what to do. They were helpless, you know? Yeah. And then you start to feel, as a parent, if you have a kid, damn, that could be my kid. Right. And it turns into a personal story now for you well now everybody realizes that the police can lie to you uh -huh. and you know don't don't say anything until you have a lawyer present you know that's just a, a big fact that's something that people don't know and people feel scared we feel under pressure well, these men in badges man. yeah it's, it's kids and, and then you see big men in badges but even the parents were, were confused yeah. if you watch the show the mom is just as naive as the kid and it's just as clueless yeah, you know they they're both just as rights. scared and they don't know what to do. It's like, all right, let me let me just do this to get my kid home. But they're not realizing they're signing a paper that's putting them in prison. Uh, Jarrell, Jerome, this also, I mean, you've done work before this, but, you know, uh, now Emmy nomination for lead actor yeah, in a man. limited series. You're hey, going up against Mahershala. It's crazy. Hugh crazy. Grant. It's crazy. Benicio <laughs> Del Toro. Damn. I know. Where <laughs> were you when you got the news? <laughs> I, was, I was in New York. I was in a restaurant. With my manager, uh, and my mom was on the way. But it's funny because, man, my mom's slick. She she was at work, and she was like, ah, you know, I know you won't get nominated, but I'm not sure, so I'm gonna stay here at work. And then just for some reason, like we, I called her before, like, no, you gotta come see me. I have, a, you know, this this has to happen. And so she was on the way, and I was just at a restaurant with me and my manager, and um, <laughs> we uh. We were watching it live on the on the on the screen because it was on the phone, and so I was just watching. It. And the first category that they were talking about was the limited series thing. So I was like freaking out, holding on to the table. Then they were saying the names one by one. So they were like Mahershala Ali, Benicio del Toro. They didn't say my name to the fifth one. So like all these names are going by, and I'm like, like I'm sinking in my chair lower. Like this is not good. And then they said my name, and I went blank. I went like I didn't I didn't even know. All I know is my. My manager looked like she was about to like pass out. Everyone around us was freaking out. Like, what's happening? This table is going crazy because she was on the floor. I was, I don't even know what I did. I told you I blanked out. Because that and is then, the win. You don't need to actually it. win. That's all it was. That's that's, 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 that's it. it. That's all it was. Like, yeah, that's it. It doesn't have to be a win or anything. It's just the Emmy nomination. And just to think that that's even doable for me, for where I'm from, for my age. I just felt like this is fake. How is this happening? But I just feel blessed and. I just held on to that moment. I saw my mom, and we hugged each other so tight. And we were crying. Well, that work nice. paid off. Man. I mean, you had to Congrats. think. Well, you did, how old were you, you when you did Moonlight? I was eighteen. And you had. To, were you surprised by how well received Moonlight was? Yeah, that was another crazy moment. That's why this moment was like, what the hell? This is another crazy moment. But that Moonlight uh, whole that those years were crazy because I did it. I was in school. Like, I went and left school for 12 days and then came back to my college campus and was wow. just in my dorm room for the rest of the year waiting for something to happen. Then a year later, Moonlight gets nominated for eight Oscars, all these Golden Globes, and I'm still in my dorm room. Just getting like... Where were you in school? I was at Ithaca College, yeah. upstate New York. I was doing BFA acting. And so I was just getting calls from my manager who was sending me tapes. Like, it was all small work. It was yeah, just yeah, yeah. stay focused, finish school, and see what lands and hits. And so... Um, Imagine like having a test tomorrow, but you got called. It's like, yeah, the movie you was in just got eight Oscar nominations. <laughs> like that's how I was living for a while. And so that whole that whole stuff was was insane, just finding all of that out. And then um I booked Mr. Mercedes. It's a TV series that I was on for three seasons. That took me out of school. So since then I've been out of school. Uh you um now lined up, I'm reading here. Idris Elba and you. Yeah. So you let Idris Elba be in a movie with you, huh? Yeah, you know, cool. I, That's the homie. He, he was like, called me. You a lightweight look. <laughs> he you called me. Mean? I said, uh, yeah, we can make it. I look out for you, my G. <laughs> <laughs> Have you crazy. shot this yet? Yeah, we shot it. We just finished last Friday. 
And it's called Concrete Cowboys, called Concrete but you Cowboys. don't know when it's coming out. Uh, it's trying to go to Sundance in January. So if it goes to Sundance in January, I'd say like next summer. So soon. That's pretty soon. Soon, yeah. It'll, yeah. Be, it'll be quick. Hopefully and by it's, the next uh, year. It's a, what, what role do you play in the film? So it's cool. Um, just a quick breakdown, if I could. It's about a, a kid coming from Detroit back to Philly to live with his father, who he hasn't seen his whole life. And his mom's like, you need to get away from trouble. Go to Philly with your father. And so his father is the owner of this ranch in Philly. And this is based off true stories. So in, in North Philly right now, um, I don't know if you guys know about the urban cowboy culture, which yeah. is Lil Nas X. They have, is yeah, they up, have, um, in, in Brooklyn, they have some cowboys too. That's right. Yeah. In Compton, they have it all Compton, over, yeah. all, these different, all these different hoods and stuff. So in Philly, there's the problem in Philly is that gentrification is taking them out. So all these investors coming in and putting condos on top of these ranches. And so there's one ranch left in Philly. So the movie's just the, about their plight and about their struggle to stay up. So anyway, it's about this kid who goes to live with his father who is um, the owner of the ranch. And I play the kid's cousin who is heavy in the street life, who's, who's dealing drugs to get out of it. But the cool, like, there's just a good back. I don't know how much I can say, honestly. But look, I play, I play Caleb's cousin in it, and he has this. <clears throat> he's going through the struggle of: Do I live with my father, focus on these horses, or do I go into the, you know, street life? And I think you've never seen a film where you're dealing with cowboys, horses, and drugs. And drug dealers. <laughs> yes, no, I've never you know, seen what? that. You know, never seen never that. Never seen that. So, and it's also I really, I really feel confident in the director's work. I think it's gonna be a beautiful piece. Listen, just make sure after you leave here, from now on, when people introduce you, mm -hmm. they say the Emmy nominated. You know, at all times. <laughs> at all times. I don't care if I don't care if it's family. Like, oh, Jarrell's here. No, no, the Emmy nominated Jarrell is here. I'm gonna make sure the airports do it too. Yes, the Emmy nominated actor Jarrell Jerome. Right, if they're calling up. you like you you got bumped up or something. <laughs> yeah, Excuse me, uh, <laughs> the passenger Emmy nominated Jarrell Jerome. <laughs> the man. You know how many looks? Dude, just be like, <laughs> Emmy nominated. <laughs> Don't beat on. Oh, no. <laughs> Go beat on, man. You want to battle Rosenberg? No, Yo, wait, no, no. before Jarrell goes, man. So, wait. You're from the Bronx. You rap too. I mean, it's the home of hip hop. It's where hip hop started. Yeah, it is. The BX. So, yes, I mean, are you nice, nice, or are you like singing, rapping? Like, where, where no, you at I'm, with this? You? I'm nice, nice. I'm lyrical. You KRS one with this? You are, uh, yeah, you know? Nas, sort of oh, Jay Z okay, influence. Okay. I grew up very, I mean, I, I was rapping first. That's what a lot of people don't know. I was doing the freestyle in the park, freestyle on the park bench, like throwing me words and I try to spin off the word and rhyme off the word. I was doing a lot of that. So you want up. you want to be like on uh, with Smack White's app? Uh, you want to be on URL? You want to battle rap? No, I want to just, um, I came from that, like I came from that idea and that love and that passion. Yeah. But uh, no, I want to make very focused music, and I just want to make uh, conscious music. That's have you seen plan. Hamilton on Broadway? I have seen Hamilton. Yeah. Did you do that? Are you a Broadway type where you I take saw, the bars and theater. the acting and the music? That's where it came from. Yeah, it all it all started all to combine in high school for me. So before it was like I'm just rapping, but it wasn't like I want to be a rapper. It was just a hobby I had. It was freestyling. It was having. It was fun a way to get out that. your ideas. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it was. And then I got to high school, and that's when I started acting. I went to LaGuardia, the performing arts school. So when I started acting, I started seeing these similarities between acting and music, freestyling, improv, playing characters, playing mm. different cadences in your flow. You know, so they started to go hand in hand. And then Moonlight started to happen. When Moonlight happened, that's when I realized that a platform was about to start for me. And if I could have this platform to turn my music from a hobby into a, into a real passion, into work, then I'm going to try. Well, I got bad news for you. No uh, one has ever transitioned from I being know. an actor into a rapper. Well, that's so. the thing. That's why I'm trying Stover. to start it early. I, I feel like I'm still young in the acting career, but you are right. And it's definitely risk. And that's Don't why worry, I'm in. joking. I'm talking about Drake. He did it well. So there's still an opportunity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's Drake. There's, there's the number one. <laughs> there's a lot of rappers turn actors. Way more common. Way more common. But and the number one guy in the game who is a damn good rapper. Mm. Started as an actor. Started as an actor. So you already have recorded True. a bunch of stuff. Yeah. But people will I sleep on you because you're an actor. Stuff. Yes, so exactly. That, and, so and they slept on the, Drake, the big, though. Yeah. They're a second that's guess right. you, they'll sleep on you, but that's good for you. You know, cats you like Cypher Sounds will say Drake, no, not Drake interested. Drake also, Drake stopped acting, you know. He's bringing it back a lot more now, but he stopped for a while. That's I mean, true. Yeah, I want to keep it going. I, I, I don't want to I don't want to let um, one overpower the other. I don't know if that makes sense. I don't know if it's going to be No, possible, no, I know what you're saying, because if you get thought of too much as an actor, no one will take you seriously yeah, as a rapper. I really just want to be an artist. I feel like there's... Someone you know, who's doing art generally. Yeah, and in today's day, I think it's more possible. There's no limit to, to artists. We're doing all... You know, rappers are doing way more than rap now. True. And, and all this stuff, so... Go for it, man. Yeah, man, I'm trying. You no, know, I'll be the one to hate on you. You know what I'm saying? For sure. sure. <laughs> so you, 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 well, you I'm you also going to support you at the same time. You don't understand what it's like waking up to know you're about to be in front of Ebro. Like, that's like... <laughs> no, what we say it's just like, like, we say it's like, 
not like a lot of these rappers. You know, you're from New York, so yeah. you know where the hate comes from. It's just making sure you're real. Of course, real. it's That's respect. It. It's respect. True. That's it. Most definitely. Making sure you're authentic out here. It's respect. Uh, so are we getting an album? What What's happening? Man, it's it's um it's all in the works, exactly what I want to do. I want to do it right. That's all I know. But I have I have a lot of just tracks recorded, done, and I feel real good about them. They sound hot. They sound cool. Yo, spit so. some Acapulco on the way out. Y'all give it up for Jarrell Drains. Okay. Let's hear something, B. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Talking these boys. Uh, let me nominate I don't really... Uh, off top, no beat? No beat, Acapulco, B, off the dome. Acapulco, uh, come say right. it. See what you got, man. This is real. It's prime time, man. All right. <clears throat> oh, look. It's the rapper who turned an actor. You probably think it's the trick to go faster up on this ladder. You bastards done got it backwards. My passion took me to rap first. I ain't got no degree, but apparently I'm a master. I think I done did it backwards. Started with higher stature now. Lady sliding in, like more than a batter batter. Establish a valid pattern so I could validate all this chatter. I matter more than an atom. My adolescence is shattered, wait. I gotta catch my breath. I caught the C to catch the F like I can't pass my test. I'm never at my best, they call me great. I be like, wait, I'm way too young to be that way, but promise you, you'll see the day. It's not too far away, the Audemars and Marmalade. <laughs> I can't get a car in the city because there ain't no damn parking space. The world will teach you how to love, that's what the Carter say. I got my work lined up just like a barber's blade. Mm-hmm. Clean. Yeah. Yo, cl- yo, I hear it though. I hear it. It's a little bit. I, I hear it. I hear it. Yes, yes, the Emmy nominated. Jerome. Thank you, y'all. Appreciate y'all. Appreciate y'all.